Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon John, and we're happy to welcome back to the show, Steve D. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, John. So last time we spoke to you, uh, we discussed your, your book looking at the intersection of Gnosticism, Gnosis, and Chaos Magic. This time we're talking to you about your new book, which looks at the intersection of Chaos Magic. I would say Gnosticism. I think the ism does come up in your book, right? So Chaos Magic, Gnosticism, and personal monasticism, monastic practices, the new monasticism, chaos monasticism. What's, what's your term for the monasticism that we're discussing? Yeah, I think I think the new the new monasticism kind of covers it well, but within that it kind of brackets um, chaos monasticism, monasticism historic, and newer kind of more orthodox forms of new monasticism. Yeah, so it kind of covers it all. Yeah, well, go to uh, Amazon and buy that book. Uh, so there's the commercial for Steve, and we'll repeat that at the end. And the link will be in the notes. Uh, I got our. We're going to do the quick commercial for our Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Gnostic. We can't do the show without your financial support. You can help us out for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that, so you can just donate a dollar a month or whatever is within your budget. If you can't help us out financially, go to PayPal. Uh, oh, sorry, you can do one-time donations at PayPal.me/slash Gnostic. If you can't help us out financially, and actually even if you can, uh, the big help is telling people about the show, uh, reviewing us, liking us. We come out both on YouTube and on podcast uh, catchers. So whatever platform you're using, just give us a great rating and a great review. Recommend us to friends, email episodes to friends. That really helps us grow and keeps the show going. Uh, okay, so that is over. Uh, Steve. Uh, let me bring up my secret question sheet. So anyone who's into spirituality or alternative spirituality or whatever it is that, that we do, uh, why would they want to embrace the, the what you call the spiritual intensity of incorporating monasticism into their lives? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose I, the starting point in the book is my own journey and why I felt compelled from quite an early age to consider those options um and and but i suppose also historically if we think about the earliest monastics heading into the desert you know inspired by saint anthony um, within the christian tradition i think there's a desire if we're trying to uh, explore spiritual options or spiritual answers for ourselves there comes a point where we want to pressure test them. We want to see if they're real or to what extent are they real and how do they apply to our own journeys um, beyond just belief. You know, I think um, often when we first become acquainted with a belief system, uh, we might get overwhelmed by the metaphysical claims or the imagery, um, all of which are beautiful potentially and intoxicating. But there comes a point where our personal desire for gnosis um, and direct experience, um, at least for some of us, um, beckons us and kind of draws us into the quiet places of the desert and says, is this real? Um, can I meet, can I encounter mystery, the divine, the pleroma, what the, the, the Gnostic Christ, however we frame it, can we have a direct encounter beyond belief and i think these uh monastic paths are a time-tested um set of techniques and technologies and uh, values that um, i think are still worth exploring for us yeah so why specifically chaos magic and i think there's sort of a in cartoon idea a cliche or stereotype of chaos magic that it's all about doing drugs breaking the rules summoning mickey mouse uh and, and not doing all of this self-control based on guilt practices that uh and structure that that a lot of people would associate when they when they hear the words monastic practice mm, mm. well i'd hope that chaos uh, magic never shakes off some of those ridiculous stereotypes because it definitely needs them and it needs to give dusty Victorian um, occultism a good kick in the pants. Um, so it should always be doing that. Um, but uh, if you if you work within chaos magic for any length of time, um, as I have, 
Uh, and, and certainly if you explore the kind of um, the works of someone like Peter Carroll, within his book Liber Chaos, um, in which he's looking at what an integrative chaos magic might look like you know how how do we pull together these vast array of approaches and and he systematizes it within that book and calls it the um the colors of chaos um and he looks at the eight directions of the chaos star which is very similar to the the pagan wheel of the year and he tries to map onto those eight directions a variety of magical types for example Red magic, war magic, purple magic, sex magic, etc., etc. And in the appendices of that book, um, he has a section on chaos monasticism, um, in which he looks at the idea of a temporary um, set or kind of embracing of vows um, that are uniquely personal to the individual. Um, as a way of intensifying their spiritual um, practice and their magical practice. Um, and he also sets out um, a, a varying degree of intensities. Depend he calls them observe levels of observance, I think he calls them. And um, so for me, you know, I think we talked about this in the last interview, coming from a kind of Christian background. Um, and certainly when I was, I, I called myself a Christian, at one point, I came quite close to um, becoming a uh, third, uh, a Franciscan monk within the Anglican Church. Um, so that, I suppose, that idea of monasticism um, has always been intriguing and attractive to me. And so, it was perhaps natural that I would make a link between my previous um, interest in monasticism and what's this thing chaos monasticism and how might it apply to kind of contemporary practitioners um, what's its relevance so I suppose I started writing the book um, with a set of questions in mind and a curiosity in mind and and the book is sort of an exploration of those questions what is this thing could it be valuable what might we want to embrace from traditional monasticism what might we want to question or even reject? So it's an exploration of those questions. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the show, but when I finished high school, I almost spent a year at a Catholic monastery in Nebraska, you know, after reading a, a lot of Thomas Merton as a, as a teen, but for a whole host of factors, including wanting to have sex, or maybe in my case, wanting to try to have sex, uh, <laughs> decided decided that wasn't the right thing for me at that time. But, but I understand this fascination, uh, uh, obsession even, uh, I think you might use the word obsession in, in your book, uh, with monasticism and the pull of it. And, you know, I, I have a partner, I live in the world, I, I don't think I'm going to be retreating to the monastery or the forest anytime soon. So I, I think your book is, has been very valuable for me and be very valuable for, for many readers for kind of splitting the difference and learning how to live in the world uh, with with mm. uh, 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 monasticism. Now, the, you also have a very uh, uh, another evocative phrase that I, I'm wondering if, that you can unpack for us, which is the embrace of strangeness and otherness. Can you can you talk to us about the strangeness and otherness of monastic practice, monastic worldview? I think I think there's something profoundly um, on one level for the majority of human beings. Uh, I think there's something profoundly unnatural about monasticism. So I think it it runs contra to uh, many biological urges, um, where, you know, whether it's to have a partner, whether that's a heterosexual one, a gay one, a bisexual one. Um, so that I suppose in traditional terms, it's the renunciation of those romantic bonds or, or um, and also, um, I suppose the renunciation of possessions and um, that sense of security that we often try and create for ourselves through things and status um, and also free will because you know in, in most monasticisms have the idea of obedience within them to something or someone um, so I think monasticism it really does uh, turn the world on its head in some ways um, so 
it's quite um, revolutionary from that perspective. Um, but I, but I think as the book kind of tries to unpack a bit, we can see some of those um, those urges as being strongly Gnostic as well. And if we look at groups like the Cathars, you know, we can see many similarities. And and in some ways, I think in the book, I, I draw the power. I, I depict the kind of birth of Franciscanism to some extent as a reaction to what the Cathars were doing well and what attracted um, many people to the good people. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we don't have evidence of, of the ancient Gnostic groups having monasteries, formal monks and nuns, though we have some Gnostic and gnostic -y groups, some evidence of them living communally, wanting to live uh, communally, building the perfect society. But I've always found that there's something profoundly Gnostic, capital G, uh, about monasticism, particularly when we try to bring it into our day-to-day -day lives, because when I read the ancient Gnostic texts, I, I really kind of see them as as trying to have that balance, to be of the world, living their day-to-day -day lives, but not of the world. So yeah, can you talk to us a, a bit about Gnosticism and monasticism? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think I think there's something you know, as we were saying earlier about the the monastic drive to pressure test beliefs and orthodoxies in order to encounter um, God, however we conceptualize God, more directly. And I think that's a Gnostic, for me, that's a Gnostic impulse. Um, but also, I think Gnosticism um, really challenges us as human beings to consider our encounter with the natural world but i don't mean i don't mean um biology i mean our idea of what it means to be a human and the limits uh, of, of that and certainly within the buddhist tradition for example um that idea of stripping everything back to try and reduce suffering and then have a direct experience of the self um i think that's profoundly gnostic so i think um yeah, well, it's just interesting, certainly within the Christian timeline of, um, of, of when, you know, monasticism was birthed, um, you know, w was a heady kind of period, kind of slightly post-Gnostic in terms of the earliest Gnostics, but um, almost embodied it and maybe some of the Neoplatonic sort of influences that were also feeding into Gnosticism as well. So I think there is... Um, something complex but intriguing going on yeah yeah i i think uh regular listeners watchers of the show lately have figured out that i'm trying to figure out hegel that that that's been my latest jam mm. how can hegel and dialectus dialectics uh dialectical thinking uh help us balance out living in the world and being a monastic yeah sure I think that's a again it's a good question um i think in the book um i talk as i do in most of my books about the gurdjieff work and 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 you know that whole fourth way approach to thinking about what it means to be a, a sly person um uh, awakened in the world um finding the Samung brotherhood the, that elusive monastery, um, not in not in the deserts of Central Asia, but actually within the world, and um, incorporating um, the idea of the monk being the way of the heart, the yogi being the way of the mind, and um, the fakir being the way of the body, and and so when we hold those things in dynamic tension, we create a fourth way of seeking balance between all those paths in the world. Um, so for me, that has a lot of parallels with with dialectics. And um, again, as a as a psychotherapist, I also use a, a form of therapy called dialectical behavior therapy. And and in it, within that model, we talk about um, the balancing of ideas as being a place of wisdom so you know i suppose it's the proverbial middle way isn't it so um yeah between extremes and i think the challenge 
which the book picks up on in the latter portion is um, trying to make what, whatever you gain, whatever you benefit from thinking about monasticism, how do we make that profoundly our own rather than just a um, an aping of orthodoxies or restriction, which for me aren't in keeping with the Gnostic path, but a, a profound taking of responsibility for, for being in the world in a way that um, embodies kind of peace, freedom and happiness, however we think of those things. Yeah. So in the book, you open up with kind of a history of monasticism and in some ways what we can take and learn from this history. Can we talk a, a bit about that that section and, and some, some important figures? I was wondering if you could tell us a, a bit about St. Francis and the Franciscans and how you can see their influence on this chaos magic monastic <laughs> path. Well, I've fallen out with, um, I nearly became a Franciscan monk and I know um, a couple of, I'm, I'm friends with a couple of Franciscans within the independent sacramental movement. So I still have um, some loose ties to Franciscans and they, they uh, look at me in horror when I talk about chaos magic um, as being highly heretical. But I suppose the thing about St. Francis, you know, if we're thinking about, oh, I'm terrible at remembering dates, but if we're thinking about the 13th century, um, as Francis uh, returned from the Crusades um, or his attempt to be part of the Crusades, um, and he underwent a profound kind of crisis of faith. Um, he, he experienced uh, a Gnostic encounter with, um, with Christ and, um, and, and his experience, Jesus told him to rebuild his church. And for him, um, he sat outside of the existing forms of clericalism and monasticism and he just saw himself as a troubadour for the lord you know he saw himself as a a beggar for christ and um his and as i've said already i i think that there's probably a good argument to be made that he was inspired to some extent by the cathars and um the simplicity and the sort of um the ministry that they embodied just to the regular people, um, rather than being a distant cleric, um, you know, the Cathars were amongst the people, and that's that was largely their appeal. And 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 Francis, um, I, I remember a Franciscan friend told me off for calling Franciscans monks, and he said, "No, we're not monks. We're friars. Where, you know, and we are in the world. We are. We have an apostolate." Um, into the world and um yeah and, and i i think you can still see that in franciscans uh, of various varieties around the world and that with their ministry to the poor I, I i you know um my own career in social work and psychotherapy was largely you know inspired by their example and i suppose um in in monastic terms we talk about a charism don't we that often monastic orders are founded by a visionary individual or um or in some cases a rule um and that charism or the idea of a gift is that they those each order is seeking to offer a gift to the world and in the case of francis arguably his his charism is um is ministry to the poor so yeah I've still got a lot of time for Francis and I have a statue of him on one of my altars um, next to Sophia. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a, a bit about the Begans who I, I feel like have never really properly gotten their due until the 20th century in some ways and now the 21st yeah. century? Yeah, sure. So, so the Begwins, you know, we're, again, historically we're thinking about, um, I'm just trying to remember the time frame. I'm thinking kind of 11th, 12th century and, and with geographically, we're talking about the flatlands in the Netherlands and Belgium and places like that. So, um, and what we have there is the really interesting phenomena of um, a group of um, women largely, but also men called Begards who, um, 
who founded communities together inspired by monasticism but not adhering to a um an overarching rule so often they would have a sense of a rule within their houses um and uh and so these kind of radical um these radical communities were founded and initially they were thought of as being quite positive by the papacy and the episcopacy um but increasingly the authorities became nervous about this very um female feminine mysticism that was often kind of profoundly non-dualistic and in some cases quite erotic as well in terms of the um how they expressed ideas about union with christ so yeah these were it was a, a i suppose a proto example of new monasticism in that it was um decentralized and often um they would be working in secular industry so a lot of the beguins <clears throat> were associated with the weaving industry um and continued actually up until uh, i think the last group um died out uh in the, in the 20th century but there's been some attempts recently to revive some communities and i and i was reading about a community that was calling itself a beguin community uh again so a very um for me a very inspiring and slightly anarchist um kind of um non-centralized form of uh, monasticism but interesting how potentially threatening that can be to um kind of sent attempts at centralized control i think a lot of people would be surprised that you bring up protestantism i mean didn't the protestants uh protestants uh, try to wipe out monasticism didn't they destroy the monasteries can you tell us what what impact they had on monastic mysticism sure uh well it's kind of complicated as, as you're saying you know it is it is really complicated um so the, certainly the earliest the earliest forms of um kind of magisterial reformation by which we mean like the lutherans and and the calvinists were decidedly anti-monastic um but uh you know groups like the anabaptists and the quakers um in their sort of um i suppose kind of that i think you use the word communal and you know we we, we think don't we in a stereotype type way about the amish today but you know that idea of here are these elect communities that are that are embraced through choice you know in the case of the anabaptists via adult baptism but um they they had a kind of they had a, a monastic feel to them even if they weren't embracing celibacy um or, although in the case of the shakers you know who were born out of the quakers <laughs> the um they did embrace um consciously embraced um celibacy in the book i also look at kind of a, a strange hypothesis about the birth of rosicrucianism and magical orders and in some ways you could hypothesize that the suppression of the monasteries by protestantism um you know what happened to that impulse to um pursue spiritual intensity if it couldn't be expressed in a monastic setting well interestingly pretty quickly you have the birth of uh you know the um rosicrucian manifestos uh and you have um you know the birth of freemasonry quite quickly afterwards and then martinism and you know all sorts of things are going on and i've got a hunch that you know that part of the reason that those those things arose in the collective unconscious was because people weren't allowed standard access to um the monasteries mm -hmm. um and then you know you know as a um as someone whose church has been influenced by anglo-catholicism um that you know the, the the oxford movement and the rebirth of um the anglo-catholic tradition also coincided with the rebirth of monastic orders within the anglican communion 
Um, so you have a sort of interesting, um, interesting forms of arguably Protestant uh, monasticism, although they were very Anglo-Catholic ones as well. Um, but I think in contemporary terms, I think the Methodist Church has a monastic order, the Lutherans do. So um, I think you, you can't keep a good impulse down, can't, can you? And, and, and so if you try and suppress something, there are still going to be people who feel called to um, pursue a version of that, even though it might be slightly tweaked out or look slightly different. Um, that that it seems like a human need, and therefore it will find a, um, expression somehow. Yeah. Um, I've heard there's a criticism that 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 I like that I find very interesting that I've brought up on the show before, it's specifically using the example of. Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, but I, I think it could be applied to to other practices. But but it's basically the spiritual practices that uh, are found in North America in forms of secular mindfulness and forms of Western Buddhism that are meant for householders or are meant for day to day people come from monastic practices. Come from people who can do nothing but meditate for most of the day, are living very simply, don't have responsibilities necessarily outside of the monastery. And some of these practices are designed to be very involved with self-denial and to break the bonds that we have with the world, even in some ways break the bonds that we have with others, right? Break the bonds mm -hmm. that are built within us mentally. Uh, and perhaps this is a good thing if you're a renunciant, but maybe teaching these practices to people who are looking for stress relief, it might cause some problems. Maybe putting them in a spiritual context that is not the specific, uh, specific spiritual context might be an issue. So, so I'm wondering what, what you think of this criticism and if you see any truth to it, how do we get around this? Uh, how do we figure out what practices might be helpful that come from monastic traditions and which ones we should avoid? Is it just trial and error? Because, you know, some of these some of these practices are really meant to be uh, built upon and done a lot. So uh, tell me some of your thoughts about that, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's complicated, but I think you're, you're onto something. I, I think for me, um, you know, say, for example, in the Buddhist case, you know, we talk about the, the three treasures or the three jewels and, you know, of the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And part of the difficulty, at least for me, is that um, the unbolting of, say, something like um, insight meditation from the idea of ethics and community is potentially hazardous, you know, that you could... As you say, the, these are profound technologies of deconstruction. You know that they they are designed to basically hammer you apart, and um, in, uh, that's a, an aspect of that. Um, and to do, to undertake that project outside of a supportive community and some kind of ethical guidance could be hazardous. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, I, I'm into the project of personal deconstruction. So, you know, I'm not going to criticize anyone for having a go. And um, yeah, so I think I, I think people should, you know, should be spiritual adults and take responsibility for what they want to undertake. Um, but I think it's also important to pay attention to the, the, the context, the religious and um, sociological context in which these techniques are kind of embedded, um, you know, and, and think, okay, well, even if I can't uh, find a classic Sangha, how do I find other practitioners or a teacher who can support me? How can I find my version of that, even if I can't, or I don't even want to exactly replicate it? So yeah, th those are good questions. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose another thing that's interesting about monasticism, certainly within a Christian context um, and within a contemporary Gnostic context, is the, the idea of third orders or oblates. So um, often, you know, within the Franciscan community, um, when it first started, there was a big danger of loads of people just leaving their families to follow Francis. And, and so there was a kind of social... Um, kind of chaos that was kind of ensuing 
as a result of his inspiration. And so the question was, well, how can I live a Franciscan kind of life, but stay in my family and, and you know, be a baker or a blacksmith or whatever. And so this idea of the third order of the third order Francis, of St. Francis was the idea of, of trying to live according to a rule, even if one was uh, living in the world. And, and a lot of other orders quickly followed suit and, um, you know, and, and started things like, you know, the Oblates within, um, I think the Benedictines and the Dominicans both have them. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Dominicans, obviously. The Dominicans aren't great fans of the Gnostics, as far as I can tell. Um, but but um, it, my understanding is that the um, Apostolic Johannite Church has a, has a form of oblates as well. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So uh, people can uh, check it out at otsj.org. So it's the Order of the Temple and Oblates of St. John. It is for people already involved with the church. But if you are involved with the church, you, you can apply and you can, in a structured way, bring monasticism into your day-to-day -day life. So uh, feel free to check that out, everybody out there, uh, otsj.org. Uh, thank you for the uh, the prompt, Steve. <laughs> um, so talking about practice, you have uh, a lot uh, about practice in the book. So it's not just a history book to, to clarify to people. It's not just uh, thoughts and philosophy on monasticism. Yeah, you do give some some practices, some paths to practices, some suggestions. It's, it's a very practical book. So could we start with you know, kind of creating a space within your home, setting up an altar, making a monastic cell. Like, is, is that is that where we start? And do you have some ideas about that? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I, I've always been a kind of a visually inspired person, and I, and I and I love art, so it was always easy for me to be thinking spatially about creating altars. Um, and I think because I've spent a lot of time involved with like neo pagan traditions that's kind of a part of that as well but I think creating some sort of space in one's home even just like a, a shelf um, that you can use as a as a way of reconnecting to um, to your kind of spiritual goals and practices is um, I think just symbolically and spatially important um, and inspiring and it's often really interesting um to notice what you're adding and taking away from that space as you try and um a, as you try and create something that reflects your spiritual goals and your spiritual state so they can act as almost like mirrors to each other uh and i find that really refreshing uh i've got numerous um altars around my house much to the um terror of anyone who visits um and my my adult children just like laugh at me, um, but but they have their own versions of those things. They just got you know, Pokemon on them and and various you know things like that. Right, right. Uh, the pictures of our lost dead ones are a form of uh, ancestor celebration, right? An ancestor uh, altar in all of our homes. Mm. So, yeah. Can you retreats? We can do home retreats, right? And I think you have some suggestions for structured retreats that, that people could do that kind of are an intersection already of monasticism and chaos magic and possibly Gnosticism and Gnostic worldview. Could you could you give us some suggestions or talk to us about doing a retreat? Yeah. Um, there are lots of different ways of doing that, you know. Um, and, and even just having time out or... Um, if a friend works, I know, you know, I have an arrangement with a good friend of mine when he's um, out of his home and he, and he offers me his home because, you know, and I'll go there without the distractions of my phone and my laptop and just use that space to meditate and to read, even if it's just for a morning. Um, so, so activities like that can be really helpful. Um, other things. Yeah, I mean, things less like reading and um, bodily practices like yoga, I think just, you know, most monastic traditions, unfortunately, um, for many of us, <laughs> start early in the day. So, you know, it does challenge us to think about our, how we use our time and when we might wake up and when we might go to bed. And, and, and you know, as, and as the book talks about, most monastic communities use some version of like 
the monastic hours where there are markers throughout the day in which we um, we use them as anchor points to turn our attention towards noon or Compline at bedtime and, and, and things like that. So just having some of that structure for oneself um, can be helpful um, just to, I don't know, create an internal sense of discipline, but at the same time, freedom. So, you know, there are, if one joins, um, you know, third orders or oblates, there may be sort of not requirements, but um, some, some kind of more solid guidance on how to do that, those things. Um, but within, within certainly the kind of chaos magic world, it was, um, it was driven by the will of the magician and their kind of personal goals that you identify as part of that magical work. So you also mentioned pilgrimage, but you know, pilgrimage is both a lot of time, right? You have to take time off your work. Maybe you only have a couple of weeks of vacation, but then also the cost, right? Because, oh no, I, I can't take a vacation because the funds that I would, I, I would have spent on taking my vacation from work, I'm going to go do on a pilgrimage. So, so it's a good sacrifice. Maybe that's not available to everyone. So hmm. can you, can you talk to us about pilgrimage, why pilgrimage could be, or should be important? And do we have to go somewhere is really special and spend a lot of money getting there? Yeah. So in, in the in the book, I, I look at pilgrimage and I also look at the pack, the practice of um, psychogeography. Uh, there's an interview with Julian Vane, who's a uh, who's done a lot of things with psychogeography. Um, and in in that thinking, you know, perhaps perhaps it's my uh, background as a magician, but there's a lot about the expectation that we create in preparation for a pilgrimage. So um you know, the anticipation of an act can be as powerful as the act itself. And so hypothetically, if we were going to be hiking with some friends on the weekend um, and we knew we were going to do that just locally um, or on our own, if we approach it, you know, it, it's, it's the state of mind and mindfulness, I suppose, that we approach any act. And so any movement through space and using the body can be pilgrimage. Um, I think if it's associated with something that's uniquely powerful to yourself, you know, it could be going to your favorite author's grave, or it could be um, going to see your spiritual director. And, you know, even that you think, okay, I, I, I'm going to tune in a day or two before even just to that journey so that the expectation builds and then the process opens up something new. Um, in the um, section on pilgrimage, I also talk a bit about um, what happens in the body as we're moving through space and, uh, and about um, how we might be processing trauma or difficult experiences. So there's some early research looking at um, how bilateral movement um, can help the processing of trauma. And so the idea that, you know, like the Canterbury Tales or something, you know, that that we're making sense of, you know, I don't know that I suppose it's, you know, um, quite common for people to say, oh, I, I didn't know the answer to this question that I had or a dilemma I had. And then I went for a walk or I went for a jog and I wasn't thinking about it. But by the end of that, I, I, I kind of knew what I was going to do. I knew the answer, even though I hadn't been thinking about it with my conscious mind. And so the argument or the interesting question maybe is what's happening there? You know, there's like a bilateral processing and and that that theory is also underpinning, you know, EMDR, you know, the therapy that people are using a lot in trauma processing these days in which bilateral movement is used. Um, as people are recounting trauma as a way of processing it. Um, people are still a bit blurry on the science, but um, but yeah, it's interesting about whether pilgrimage is allowing some of that processing. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly things big, the big famous pilgrimages like the Camino um, are often undertaken, um, you know, by people who are struggling with something. And, you know, that there's, a, I, I think there's some sort of trauma processing going on there. Yeah. 
I think a, a cliche or stereotype or misconception about monasteries, both the monastic life, is that it is just groups of people who do nothing but pray in utter silence. Uh, they're completely focused on their own spiritual liberation. They're staring at their belly button every day. But I know the, the monastery I almost ended up in did uh, does uh, extensive work with, with undocumented migrants, with uh, refugees, uh, with immigrants. Uh, the, many of them are, in, in a very structured way, actually engaged with, with a lot of charity and doing good in the world. You, you talk about doing good in the world uh, in, this, in this structured way, in this, this chaos, magic, monastic way. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I think, again, this goes back to Francis and the kind of shift maybe that, that occurred in the 13th, 12th, 13th century about um, almost what does an engaged monasticism look like, you know. Um, but I but I do think that the challenge uh, of around like intentional communities. Um, so you have, for example, in like Washington, D.C., uh, a fairly famous group called Sojourners um, that were founded by Jim Wallace, um, you know, and um, to that idea of, well, if our spirituality means anything, if it's real, if our encounter with Gnosis is real, um, what are we going to do with it? You know, how are we going to um, express our charism, our gift into the world in a way that um, eases suffering or, um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe we're on the cusp of... Um, new charisms um, about climate change or you know about uh you know um lgbt plus equality that those are new charisms aren't they and and perhaps and i think to some extent activism can be can be a form of contemporary friarship if i can use that word you know so that it's that same apostolic impulse um but again you know, maybe the, the 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 friars of old have something to teach us about preventing burnout because you know so much activist burnout is because of not having spiritual tools to nurture the heart and to kind of um, kind of make sure that we don't burn out through our our, our busyness. You end the book with a, a very beautiful uh, wisdom mass, a mindful mass to Sophia. C can you tell us what motivated you to to write this, why you think it might be of interest both to, to Gnostics, people who want to try this, this form of monasticism, maybe anybody who is, you know, involved with Gnostic or mystical spirituality? Yeah, so... So my own, so at a personal level, I was under, I've been undertaking a year long working to Sophia. So I, I kind of felt that that was something, whether it sounds grandiose, you know, that she was calling me to do. And, and therefore, when the book talks about dialectics and finding a wisdom in the balance point, um, it felt fitting to dedicate the book to her in some way. Um, and that mass was something that I, I did with some friends. So we, we had that, it's a working, so it's a record of that working to some extent. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, in the book, I look at the three monastic vows of poverty, of, of obedience and chastity and, and think, quite a bit about what those things could mean for us as contemporary people um, in the belief that not being kind of prescriptive about them, but considering the implications of those values could bring wisdom and could bring healing to us um, in thinking about what we own, the relationships and accountabilities that we hold and also how we um, are faithful uh, to the people who are important in our lives, you know. So, I think there's wisdom in there. That and that's, I think that's my hope that you know that that monasticism has meant a lot to me in in its various forms. And I just want I, someone asked me recently, you know, do is it do you write for beginners? Uh, and I said, well, I don't kind of write for anybody. I don't write for an audience. I write 
in my own endeavor to understand some questions and fight, explore the implications of them. So um, I suppose this book in some ways is my love letter to monasticism and um, I hope other people find it helpful as a result, you know, and, um, and then have got a toolbox uh, with which to ex explore what it could mean for them, how, wherever they take it. Well, I think that's an awesome place to wrap up. So the name of the book is Chaos Monk, uh, bringing creativity to the monastic. I have the, uh, the what's the full title, Steve? It's uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I can barely remember it. Um, it's Chaos Monk, bringing magical creative creativity to the new monastic path. Thank you. So I, I have the link up on the screen, but of course it's a long URL to get it at Amazon, or you can also get it in Kindle form. I'm of course going to put this in our show notes. So run, don't walk, even though you're already on a device if you're listening to this. So just click, click that link, buy this book. Uh, you will thank me for giving this rack. I really loved it, Steve. Do you have any other plugs or places you want to send people if they're interested in your work or things they should pick up or uh, uh, give us your commercials, Steve? Oh, okay. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, the blog of Baphomet.com is the place that um, will reference my other books if you want to check them out. Um, and also, um, I haven't been writing a lot on there because I've been busy with the book, but um, certainly Julian and Nikki, who I've worked with over many years, their teaching and support um, stuff is on there. Um, yeah, no, that, that's that's probably be about it. But um, I just hope that people find it helpful. And as I say, you know, if you're interested in Gnostic forms of monasticism, uh, check out the AG AJC, uh, you know, as it's one of the best places um, around uh, and it offers a really kind of mature Gnostic manifestation of, of these kind of ideals. Yeah. Well, thank you. For, thank you for that plug. I agree. And as I said, anybody out there interested in both uh, the AJC and uh, the ONI Church, uh, there is a monastic order, uh, otsj.org. So check that out. Uh, really quick plugs for myself. Hey, talking about doing monasticism at home, I do weekly meditation. It's for everybody. It's not specifically Gnostic. It's not specifically anything. It's secular morning meditation. It's good. Uh, I have to travel or do things that aren't it. Uh, HolyGrail.substack.com and my character in Montreal if you're ever around. And those are the plugs. Steve, thanks again. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.